Did you know that you can actually disappear in real life? Legally? Ever wish that you can restart your life all over again and be reborn as a completely different person? Well, listen on. You might learn a thing or two. Hello there, welcome to my first channel content. I always have the idea of creating a video essay, sharing about my thoughts and analysis on films I enjoy. After so many months of procrastination, I'm so glad that I'm finally doing this. Yes! So during my semester break, I decided to binge on Studio GB films. Spirited Away in particular really caught my attention because of the film's rich details and symbolism, composition, character depth, and Japanese belief. I got interested in the concept of kamikakushi and found that this concept is prevalent throughout Japanese cinema. I'll be referencing two particular films, not only Spirited Away but also Demon Slayer. Do note that if you haven't watched the films yet, there will be spoilers. So without further ado, let's start the journey. Kamikakushi was used among the Japanese to explain the sudden disappearance of individuals for an uncertain period of time. In English, the meaning of Kamikakushi literally translates to spirit away, or to remove a person without anyone noticing. When someone is said to have been Kamikakushi, it would be believed that the person was abducted by spirits, also known as kamis in Japanese. Fun fact, Kamikakushi had been prevalent in Japanese folklore as early as the 8th century, which was actually more than a thousand years ago. Wow. To better understand Kamikakushi, instead of going back a thousand years ago though, let's just go back to 111 years ago. At 1910, when a Japanese scholar called Yanagita Kunio published a book called The Tales of Tono. According to Yanagita, this book accounted real-life spiritual experiences and legends of Tono Village, a rural town in Japan. In this book, Yanagita listed out a few important traits or characteristics of Kamikakushi which you can actually see from both films. Yanagita believed that Kamikakushi usually occurs during winter and harvest seasons. Secondly, uninhabited areas like the forests or mountains further increases the likelihood of Kamikakushi because of the high spiritual energy present there. And thirdly, the abductor is usually a Tengu. A Tengu is a Japanese deity which are known to abduct humans for the pure reason of torture or, weirdly, to teach them magic. Among all forms of Tengu, the Daitengu and Kotengu are the popular ones. Kotengus are known for their cannibalism, and you can see this form from the main antagonist Yubaba in Spirited Away. While the common belief towards Yubaba's form is Yamaoba, but given that Miyazaki is someone really detail oriented he definitely would have not missed out the Tengu because it is a prominent feature of Kamikakushi. The Daitengu on the other hand is more common. Daitengus are known for their large nose, wings, and red face, which you can notice from Urokodaki in the Demon Slayer. Daitengus live in deep mountains and were exceptionally skilled in swordmanship, flight, and wind control, which Urokodaki perfectly demonstrated in this series. <laughs> You probably look like one too after stepping on Lego bricks. Let's start by delving deeper into the portrayal of Kamikakushi in Demon Slayer. To understand the story theme and character arc from this series, let me introduce another Japanese scholar from the early 1800s, Hirata Atsutane. At 1822, he published a book called Senkyo Ibun. In this book, Atsutane interviewed a boy that claimed to have been abducted by a high-ranking Tengu. In other words, this boy, named Torakichi, claimed to be a life witness and survivor of Kamikakushi. According to Torakichi, upon his arrival to the other world, he had to undergo an initiation ritual to test his ability, fitness, and desire to live in the other world. The rituals involved were inhumane. The first test for Torakichi would be for him to fast a hundred days. To prove his resolution, the Tengu had his fingernails pulled off. This, however, was not enough to suppress the unbearable hunger Torakichi had to endure. And after a few days, he broke the fast by eating a rice ball given to him earlier from the human world. The punishment? Being thrown down the mountain for seven straight days. This story mirrors Demon Slayer in the sense that the main character Tanjiro was also trained by a Tengu, or rather, someone closely resembling a Tengu to own his skills as a Demon Slayer. Tanjiro himself underwent immense and even inhuman training to prove his resolution to live as a new self in the spiritual world. 
Uh, Sutane also acknowledged that Torakichi was exceptionally skilled in swordmanship and combat for his age, just like Tanjiro. The training itself was conducted in deep mountains for both cases, far from civilization. This makes sense, given that mountains are a safe haven for spirits like tengus and demons to reside in. During an interview, a Japanese named Maho said that Kamikagushi's stories were common children tales told by adults, like how we were always told the story of the rabbit and turtle back in our childhood days. She further added that the vanish would always come back with some mark, something to show that they had been taken. At the ending of Spirited Away, Chihiro was given a new hairband by Zeniba as a token of friendship and memories of them in this spirited world. What exactly happened after she and her parents returned was never revealed, and it's left for us to theorize and speculate. What we do know, however, was that Chihiro's days spent in the spirited world seemed short despite the many journeys she made. By rewatching the film, it seemed to me like there were only 3 to 4 days. Day 1, when she arrived and got the job. Day 2, when she met her parents as pigs and also the river spirit. And the third day, when she journeyed to meet Zeniba. But upon her arrival with her parents back home, it seemed as if years went by, most likely a few decades. Judging from the state of the building, the greenery present, and the state of the car, if you compare it with the beginning and end of the film. The building obviously went through major changes, as you can see from the walls, the entrance arc size, and the growth of the plants. Chihiro's hairband and the events after her return from the spirited world carried a disturbingly close resemblance to one of the oldest legends of Kamikakushi. Written at the early 8th century, this legend depicted the story of a fisherman named Urashima Taro, also known as Urashima Ko. After rescuing a sea turtle, the fisherman was rewarded by being spirited away to the world of the Dragon Palace, where he was believed to have spent a few days there in bliss. Upon his request to return to the human world, however, he was given a treasure box, known as Tatame Bako, as a parting gift, and was instructed to never open it. When he arrived back to the present human world, he realized that his parents were long dead and everything in his village changed as if centuries had passed. The few days spent in the spirit world was apparently hundreds of years in the human world. Terrified, the fisherman opened the box and almost instantly became crippled and old and returned to his present state as dust. If this was borrowed from the legend of the fisherman, then Chihiro and her parents might well have already been gone for at least a hundred years. Just like the demise of the fisherman if he opened his treasure box, will Chihiro and her parents be turned to dust? Should Chihiro untie her hairband? The fact that the hairband itself was particularly emphasized at the end of the film not only signified that what she experienced was real, but also to suggest something more sinister. Is Saniba really that trustable? Is the ending of Spirited Away really happy, as most people believe it to be? And that's honestly creepy. Is it even possible to wear the same hairband for the rest of your lives? All in all, there's still so much room for explanations and nobody knows what will happen after Chihiro and her parents leave. Up to this point, you might be wondering about the relevance of all this today, or even the whole point of this video. How is it possible for something like this to still exist today in Japan? From random machines selling used underwear, baby crying contests to festivals dedicated for cursing, Japan's unique culture and beliefs define their prominent position today in the world. If everything is possible in Japan, it is possible to disappear forever, legally. According to statistics before COVID-19, the number of people reported missing in Japan went from 80,000 in 2015 to 90,000 in 2019. This is an average of around 2,500 people missing yearly. However, what's interesting to also take note is that even if someone's reported missing by their family or friends, the police will not help if that person left at their own will. Japan has strict privacy laws and strongly abide to that. Hence, a number of missing cases were never acted upon. In modern Japan, this unexplained or sudden disappearance of people is termed as johatsu, which means evaporated when translated to English. Contrary to Kamikakushi, however, the reason behind Johatsu is much more realistic and believable, 
given the context of Japan's culture in modern times. According to Johatsu, the reason for one's disappearance is due to their inability to cope with life's stresses. Life in Japan might seem glamorous for outsiders, but in reality, Japan carries a culture of sekente, which means saving face. Sekente is Japan's obsessed desire and social pressure to maintain their image and pride. Mental health is considered a taboo and even a source of shame in Japanese culture. Even though there's a growing awareness of it now, a lot of Japanese still lack the mental and social support needed for their well-being and prefer keeping their problems to themselves. This leads to many individuals having an extreme desire for isolation. This lack of community support in Japan hence gave birth to agencies known as Yoniege Ya, translated as Fly by Night in English. There are plenty of websites available for such services, and here is one of the websites I found. Trusting Google Translate on this, this service covers a range of issues tailored for each individual. Upon entering the website, individuals can choose the problems they are currently desperate to escape from. This can be issues like bankruptcy, hiding from loan sharks, escaping domestic abuse, being stalked, and for even having an affair with someone married. As what I said, apart from mental health support, Japan has everything. Upon clicking whichever issue the customer can relate to, the website will however try their best to make sure that each customer really thought this through before applying, because there's no turning back and it will change their life forever. The process consists of a few simple steps. The first step is a free consultation to understand each customer's needs. The second step is necessary paperwork or documents for the arrangement. The third step is where payment is made. And the fourth step is where the action is done. And usually execution will be done night time as it is less noticeable. If you are interested to understand more about Johatsu, I recommend spending some time to go through this book, The Vanish, and also this short documentary consisting interviews of those families left behind. I'll attach the link in my description box below, so feel free to check it out anytime. In more realistic terms today, the argument of Kamikakushi might also be just an excuse to cover up murder or crimes. Or, as mentioned by Stamler, defining a missing person as having met with Kamikakushi had the psychological effect of ending the period of anxious searching, allowing relatives to deal with their loss and to name and blame a culprit. What we term as missing sometimes might just be because they are out of where we assume them to always be at, when in actual fact they might just have been lost somewhere else unharmed. Or in the case of Johasu, starting a new life without you. I love taking opportunities to delve deeper into topics I'm interested in. This is the first time creating such a video, and if there's any feedback from me on how I can improve the quality, please let me know. I'll be so appreciative. And even more so, thank you so much for spending the time to watch this, especially if you stayed till the end. If you enjoyed this video and learned a thing or two, do like, subscribe and share this out. If you got any suggestion for future contents, do let me know too, and I'll really take that into consideration. Once again, thank you, and I hope you have a good day.